Hello everyone and welcome to today's keynote with Lena Nair. This is happening as part of the 2021 Unilever Future Leaders League Global Finals. My name is Jose Nava. I am an Asia business partner for our global and European marketing teams in our foods business and I am happy to be here with you for this exciting session. Joining me today as my co-host is Sophie. Thank you so much, Jose. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophie Haynes. I'm part of the Global Employer Brand team here at Unilever, and I am beyond excited to be here with you today. Today's session is sponsored by Unilever Future Leaders League, our annual marketing competition for young talent around the world. Alongside incredible keynote leader sessions like this one, our 78 finalists are competing for the chance to be crowned as our 2021 FLL champions. Whilst there can only be one winner, they've done undeniably well to get this far and are officially the top 78 students out of 54,000. Yes, you heard that right. 54,000 applications that we've received this year. We're beyond excited to kick off our FLL finals keynotes with this session. And it's wonderful to see so many of you from our LinkedIn community also joining us. So a huge welcome. We are delighted to have you here with us today. Now, our guest today is truly special. She's broken endless records for being the first female, first Asian, and youngest ever chief HR officer at Unilever. She's been a driving force behind Unilever's newly launched social commitments with a focus on raising living standards across our value chain, creating opportunities through inclusivity, and preparing people for the future of work. Leading the agenda of people with purpose at Unilever, Let's all give a warm welcome to Lena Nair. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here. It is an absolute privilege and a joy to be with all of you here today. I must say I'm very, very proud of our finalists who, are, who have competed God knows, with 54,000 other final uh, other participants and being able to come to the stage. So I am so very proud of everything you are doing and you continue to do to be a part of FLL. You know, I've had a difficult few weeks. I lost my mother to COVID a few weeks ago. My father is struggling with COVID. So it's, I have seen a lot of moments of low energy the last few weeks, but I can promise you the, the chance of speaking with all of you today live on subjects close to my heart cheered me up. So I'm looking forward to getting lots of positive energy from all of you, lots of things to keep me going for another many weeks and months. So thank you everybody in advance for all the energy that you're going to give me and all the stuff that you're going to pump me up today with. So let me start by sharing a little bit of my thoughts about how do you become purpose led and future fit? And then we'll open it up for questions. I would love all your questions. No questions are taboo. Ask anything on your mind. And I would love to share my perspective with you, both to all our FLL participants and our LinkedIn live audience. So how do you become purpose-led in future fit? And I've tried to summarize it into sort of five lessons, which are easy to remember. But let me just talk a little briefly about my own leadership journey. You can see my school picture here. You can see me circle there. I am still smiling, started smiling all the time in all pictures for as long as I can remember. But it's a very special picture because this is the first batch of our school. So along with my batchmates, we made history because the school became the first fully established school for girls in my little hometown where I grew up. So literally when we were in seventh standard, eighth standard was being built. When we were eighth standard, ninth standard was being built and so on and so forth. So I started in a small town in India, had a very humble journey growing up, never dreamt when I was this young that I would have the opportunity to do what I'm doing today. And therefore, one of my lessons always is dream big, have big aspirations for yourself, for the country, for the community, for people around you. Always, always dream big. 
And today, when I look at my journey, having had the chance to do engineering, MBA, work with Unilever for 28, 29 years, have the chance to do what I'm doing today, which is to be in the service of 150,000 people in this company, I feel extremely privileged and lucky. So I want to then bottle up a lot of the things I've studied along the way and share that with you. So my first uh, message to all of you is, you really, really need to discover your purpose. My purpose is to ignite the human spark to build a better business and a better world. I want to spend all my time thinking about how do we ensure human capital stays important at all board tables, at all leadership tables? How do you show investment and in talent in human potential? How do you unleash people to be their best selves at work? That's what my purpose is all about. And I had to work to discover it. You know, I did my electronics and telecommunications engineering because like everyone, you know, if you were good at maths, you sort of did engineering. There wasn't all that much career counseling and all of that in those days. Well, I did enjoy the intellectual challenge of being an engineer. And I started working as a telecom engineer. I didn't enjoy it as much. I was quite a lousy engineer, to be honest. And I realized that my passion was all about people, being with people, being around people, thinking about what makes people tick really got me out of bed. So I did my MBA and specialized in human resources. So, and then there was no looking back. I did a number of roles in human resources, employee relations, ran management development, was the HR head for India, then the HR head for Asia, came to London nine years ago and became the chief HR officer five years ago. So that discovering my purpose and realizing that I really wanted to make a difference to people everywhere, really liberated me to fly. So I always say, please spend time understanding, does this make your heart sing? If it doesn't make your heart sing, you're not going to excel in it. Ask that question. You know, I have a 22 year old son who said, I don't know what my purpose is. I, how do I discover it? This is all very complicated. And I told them, do a simple exercise. Go and speak to 10 people who know you well and you trust saying, what are my biggest strengths? What sort of motivates me and what sort of gets me going and he came back surprised and he said mom all the 10 people told me when my eyes light up they can see it so you know you'll be surprised people around you know when your heart sings they know when your eyes light up when you're doing something like speaking today to you sparks my joy for sure lights up my eyes for sure so discover your purpose spend time in it ask people you care about what is your biggest strength and motivation a second lesson is we're all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. And this has come so true all through COVID times. We all have different needs. One size doesn't fit all. You know, we are in 190 countries as Unilever. And I can never assume that the experience in America is the same as in Indonesia. Right through the last 18 months, every single day I experienced this. In 17 countries, we've had to buy tests to donate it to the governments. While a lot of North America is getting vaccinated, there's a lot of the world, a lot of the countries in the world where nobody has yet got a single vaccination dose. So that is the world we live in. We can't assume that everyone is going through the same experience. You can't assume that. You've got to create solutions that meet people's needs everywhere. You know, you've got to, if vaccination is a challenge in some places, that's what you have to focus on. If finding hospital beds is a problem in a country, that's what you have to put your focus and energy on. Somewhere else, if it is about finding the medicines and oxygen concentrators, like we did in India, we were constantly buying and supplying oxygen concentrators to whoever needed them, because that was the need of the hour. So never, ever assume we're all in the same boat. We're not. Even now, I'm sort of chased by people who say we have to open up all offices soon because I'm missing everybody. I want to get back to office tomorrow. And there are others who say, you know what? This flexibility works for me. I want to work out of home for a bit longer. So you can never assume that. You've got to create solutions, certainly in my job, in creating different sizes for different people. It's not a one size fits all. A third lesson is a moment of, for reinvention. Be bold and reimagine how things are done. Our world has changed upside down. We've all learned that we can live online, we can play online, we can do whatever we want online, entertain online. So let's not waste this moment. These COVID months have shown us 
that we can do work differently. It has challenged our traditional models of employment. It has challenged how we thought about work. It has challenged how we work together. So we can, when all this is over, go back and do exactly what we were doing in 2019. Or we can ask ourselves, and that's what I tell leaders everywhere, we can ask ourselves, how can we reimagine our world? Our assumptions have been challenged. Do you want to go back exactly to the same ways of working, where you woke up every morning, you know, took public transport to work, commuted for an hour and a half, got into work, sat at your cubicle, came back? Do we want to do that five days a week, 40 weeks a year? Do we want to challenge some of that? So this is such an exciting moment because we can reinvent how we do things. My fourth lesson is ask for more. You know, I have many versions of it. If it's to be, it's up to me. Don't mourn. Don't be a victim. It's learn to stop apologizing. Learn to stop being a victim and start doing. Take the first step. Just start doing things. You know, ask more of your employers. Ask more of your governments. Ask more of, a, of your community leaders. Ask more of the people around you. Because when we ask more, we build a better world. And start doing, stop apologizing. You know, one of the things that triggers me the most and I get really angry and I sort of become a dragon as my team calls me, you know, fire, spewing fire, is when people sit around me and they show this victim mindset. They say, oh, everything sucks. The world is horrible. Politics is horrible. People are horrible. Leaders are horrible. It's all horrible. And I get really mad because I say, what are you doing about it? Your job doesn't begin and finish by just moaning, complaining, groaning, feeling miserable and making others around you feel miserable. Your job, your initiative is to do something about it. You know, once I was talking to people in this forum and I talked about many examples of people who have just grabbed leadership and changed things that they feel strongly about. And one of such people was a person called Ayman Zidik, who four years ago was at Future Leaders League. And he was really bothered about the schooling system in Bangladesh, and he set up an online 10-minute school. He wanted to disrupt schools because he thought the way we teach our children hasn't changed in 40, 50 years. The classrooms look pretty much the same. The way we teach hasn't changed. The curriculum hasn't changed enough. And he took initiative, took the first step. Instead of moaning, complaining, set up 10-minute online schools. And I'm so pleased to see he's won the Queen's honor. He's been recognized as a great entrepreneur in Bangladesh. That's what I mean. When things bother you, ask for more. Go and ask for more. Ask for things to be better. And then say, if it's to be, it's up to me and make it happen. And my last lesson before we move to question is lift others as you climb. This is so important. You know, we leave a legacy everywhere. And we have to always leave it better than how we found it. You know, it's been a unique privilege of my life to be the first, to be the first woman at every job I've done, to be the first Asian at every senior job I've done. But it, it's a huge privilege. I can tell you, breaking glass basements, glass ceilings is fantastic. It gives you a great sense of how to drive inclusion, makes you feel good that you have made it easier for some people to come after you. But it doesn't end with that. It's also a huge burden on me because I constantly have to remember that my task is to make it easier for those who come after me. You know, it's a burden because people look at me and say, okay, all women are like Lena. No, they're not. I'm just one woman. I'm just, I'm, all they look at me like a token and they say, oh, we have a woman around the table and that's Lena. No, I have to constantly bear that burden saying, no, 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 it's not enough that I have broken the glass ceiling. We have to make it easier for those who come after us. And I have so many examples in my life. You know, when I was pregnant, the maternity leave was not generous at all. It was like eight weeks. It was hard. And there was no paternity leave in those days. And one of the first things I did when I got into a position of influence and authority was change it and make a generous maternity leave across all countries we operate in. Generous paternity leave. We have 16 weeks across the world. Make it generous for everyone. Maternal leave, paternal leave. I changed the rules for everyone to make it easier for those who came after me. So constantly ask. And not only when I grew senior, when I was young in my career, you know, just a year as a management trainee, as a UFLP, 
I realized that the hotel that put me up in a small town was sleazy. It was not a great place because no woman had lived in that hotel before and didn't know it wasn't exactly safe for women. I didn't stop at just telling the admin team that please change the hotel for me. I went and sat with them and said, where are the hotels all across the country? Do those hotel rooms have bowls? Because the hotel room I had did not have a bolt inside the door. Little detail, but an important detail to feel safe. So it's things like that. I, I was just a year in the company, but I went and fought and sat with the admin team and said, how can we make it easier for others? Pushed to change that. So my advice to all of us is we've got to make it easier for those who come out after us. It's a legacy. It's something we have to carry with us. And it'll make you feel so much better because your achievement doesn't begin and end with you. So those are some of the lessons among the hundreds of life lessons I've learned. I've tried to pick a few that you could do something with. And once again, so proud of all of you. So delighted to be here and happy to take your questions and answers. Anything on your mind, go for it. I'm all here, all ready, all keyed up. Nina, thank you so much. You never cease to inspire and amaze us. And I know that the advice will prove for some really useful and incredible reflections for all of us to take. So thank you. I can tell you, Lena, that we clearly have some fans. We're seeing a lot of love from our LinkedIn community and also the questions from our FLL finalists have been pouring in. Now, Jose and I have promised everybody we are going to squeeze as many of them in as we can. So I'm going to jump straight in, Lena, and I am going to ask you, during the last couple of years, and in the last year in particular, we've seen because of the pandemic, a really unprecedented pace of change in the future of work and the way that work is. What advice do you have, particularly for young people who are starting their careers during this period of time? How can they best go about that? Yes, the future of work is all about lifelong learning. So my number one advice to you is the half-life of a skill is just two and a half years. So learn how to learn. Continuously be agile in learning. You know, it is the core of our inner game, having great learning agility. So go and hone your muscles to learn all the time. Have a board around your neck that says, I mean, virtually, not really, that says you're a learner. So learn, learn all the time. You have to reskill and upskill yourself many times. And the second quick tip is be multidisciplinary. The future is about combining the head and the heart. So focus on all your data analytics, software architecture, coding skills, all of that is fantastic. And also focus on the uniquely human emotion, empathy, compassion. So head and heart together is the next century. So make sure you are setting yourself up for that. Well said, Lena, thank you very much for that. Um, similarly in that vein, in the space of questions about career advice, and this may be a, a, a more specific one. Our next question says, what is your number one interview tip for someone at the beginning of their career without lots and lots of experience to reference? Yes, my number one interview tip is be authentic. Yeah, do not go into the interview saying, how am I going to impress them? How am I going to say things that I think they want to hear? You know, all these apps that tell us you can read a senior leader's LinkedIn post and read their mind, all of that. Just just don't think about all of that. Go there and be authentic in the interview. If you failed at something, talk about it. If you've succeeded at something, talk about it. But be authentic. It's it's like being yourself, but being yourself with a little bit of skill because interview interview also doesn't need to know every bit of your life story. So it's be yourself with a little bit of skill. That's what I call being authentic. Amazing. Thank you, Lena. Now, in terms of being at the forefront of change, there's a lot of talk about youth really being there. However, often we see that they don't always have a seat at the table. What do you think we can do to be ensuring that youth do have a seat at the table and that their voice is heard? My number one advice would be ask for it. Yeah, I do think progressive companies are more and more creating the space for everyone to contribute. Yeah, for example, our CEO leads a weekly, now it's a fortnightly call, a fortnightly call with the entire organization, where there's an anonymous platform where everyone can ask anything on their mind, contribute ideas, contribute questions, ask any difficult questions. 
So I do think progressive companies and progressive leaders are opening up the space for dialogue with everyone, including the young, which is fantastic. We, for example, at Unilever have a youth advisory board and we have some, we have 10 people on the youth advisory board. And believe me, I am overwhelmed and impressed every time I meet them because I feel like I've achieved nothing in my life compared to how much they've achieved in their youthful lives, you know, already being activists for big causes, getting governments to listen to them. And I feel, oh my God, I haven't done as much in my life. I better get going. I better, you know, start running. So if you feel you're not getting the space for your voice to be heard, ask for it. Talk to leaders saying, here are my views. I want to express them. Ask for it. Create the space in the organizations that you work in. Or make sure you work for a progressive one where your voice will be heard because every voice matters. That's how we create change. And that's why I think Sophie and I, and of course yourself, Lena, are very lucky that we are with Unilever, which is a very inclusive um, environment to be in. We feel uh, very much empowered. Um, now maybe let's pivot a bit because there are a couple of questions about you and your career journey. Yes. Um, maybe let's start with uh, something a bit more light touch. What does your typical day at Unilever look like or involve? <laughs> I, my day in office or my day at home? Because my day at home has become a series of video calls. But it's exciting because in a short period of time, I'm reviewing China in the morning and I'm reviewing Brazil in the evening. And that feels all very exciting because now I'm able to travel the world everywhere. My typical day involves talking to people all across the world, reviewing what's happening with COVID, for example, at the moment across the world. So two or three times a week, I spend enormous time on understanding how many people are sick, how are we supporting them, how are we supporting their families, the status on vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to be on the ball on COVID. I spend a lot of time talking to our customers, our consumers. I dial into consumer homes to listen to them. So consumers, customers, trade, to understand how our products are being perceived what's going on, what are the new consumer needs going on. One of the things I always do is I spend 20% of my time looking externally. You know, I just reach out to people I'm inspired by, sometimes the authors of books, sometimes senior leaders in other companies, sometimes young people doing exciting work. And I say, hey, would you like to have a cup of coffee with me? And a good bit about being CHRO for Unilever is they always say yes. They mostly say yes, yes, which is great. So I have interesting conversations about different subjects, whether it's about courageous conversations with someone like Amy Edmondson and talk about psychological safety or talk about the four day working week with Andrew, who's Andrew Barnes, who's driving it in New Zealand. So whatever catches my fancy, whatever I think is inspiring is going to be where the future is. I spend 20 percent of my time talking to external experts, authors of books to learn more about race, about LGBTQI+, plus, about inclusion, about topics that I'm very, very passionate about, and I want Unilever to be a beacon for. I must say it's a pretty packed day. I started about eight in the morning. I, you know, in the morning, I'm not such a morning person, I must confess. I have to drag myself out of bed. I really do. Even after sleeping for eight hours sometimes, I have to drag myself out of bed. And I have a little alarm clock because I time myself. I cannot have a shower more than three minutes. I cannot spend more than five minutes changing my clothes. So I literally have an alarm going every three, four, five minutes because I can go into dreamland if I don't be careful. <laughs> you know, I always used to call my mother in the morning. That was the first call I made in the day before I started my day. And losing her has been hard, but I call my dad every morning now just to make sure I'm still getting some mother and father love in the morning. And uh, then it's back to back. I try and take a break for lunch. Normally goes on till evening. I'll tell you a couple more tips. I organized to do exercise four times a week. So that hour, which is 6.30 to 7.30 on Tuesday evenings, 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday evenings, 10.30 to 11.30 on Saturday mornings, and then one additional day in the week based on my schedule, those are non-negotiable. I'll work after 7.30 if needed, but I'm not gonna touch my exercise hour, for example. And definitely before winding down, I, I watch something, I mean, my all three men in my life, I have a husband, Kumar, who is, runs this financial services company, two gorgeous boys, they all love football. So the house is always full, full of football matches, so I watch a bit of sport, and then I wind down. Another little tip, every night before going to sleep, 
I write a gratitude journal. I write the three things in the day that have happened to me that I'm very grateful for. It keeps me centered, keeps me grounded, keeps me humble, keeps me always in the learner mindset. So those are some of my tips for you. But it's a pretty full on day. In the days we used to travel, I would travel two, two and a half weeks a month. So I would be in different cities across the world all the time. Now that we don't travel, I at least get my feet on the ground for a bit and I'm able to read a little more than I did and uh, catch up with friends a little more than I did. All virtually, of course. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lena. There are definitely a lot of tips that I think we can all take from that. Now, Lena, in your keynote talk, you shared a lot of the glass ceilings and it's been referenced a lot of times about the amazing yeah, records, different things that you set and you've been the first in many different things across Unilever. Can you tell us about a time that maybe you were underestimated and how did you overcome that? <laughs> All the time. All the time I have been underestimated. All the time. When my appointment has always, always been met with, oh, Lena, she's now going to be OK. Because I've always been the youngest at the table. I've normally been the first woman. So people don't know what to expect. I have now increasingly been the first Asian in the last two or three senior jobs I've done. So people really don't know what to expect. And it's hard sometimes. I'll tell you a story. You know, I was um, uh, 34 and I was appointed as the head of, uh, I was executive director for human resources in Hindustan Unilever, which is like India's third largest company in the country very admired in Unilever, admired in India. And I was the first woman in the 90 years to get on the board of the company and the first woman. So, uh, you know, so people said all sorts of things. There was lots of positive praise saying HUL is in a great step. But there was also lots of negative press saying she doesn't have the experience, she's going to fail at it. And I remember, you know, it... I remember walking into the room for my first board meeting and I could see the skepticism and I could see the, mm, OK, let's see what she's got. So, yeah, I do feel the pressure. I tell, let me tell you, I do cry easily and I get into the loo and I have a good cry and then I feel a lot better. Luckily, one of the good things about being the only woman very often is you have, you have the loo to yourself. There's nobody else. So you have a good cry, feel better, wipe your tears and go back in. And I remember one of the people, and I won't say their name, who said, OK, you know, really, Unilever must be scraping the bottom if they have to now appoint, uh, you know, a young women with less experience to the top team. And, you know, I had a real moment of vindication when four years later, the same gentleman came to me and he said, my daughter wants to do an internship with you. And she believes you're the one leader across corporate India that inspires her. Will you do the honor of coaching her, mentoring her, because she wants to be like you. And I said, I went privately and I did, that's a good, you know, so you've got to take it in your stride. Good work eventually speaks for itself. So you've got to stop all the critics in your head, because what the critics externally do is they make the critic inside your head awake. And the critic inside your head goes, oh my God, they must be right. Maybe I'm not good enough to do this. You've got to silence that inner critic. Uh, by constantly staying positive and saying, you know what, I deserve to be here. I know what I'm doing and focus on having impact. When you have impact, when you make a difference, everybody has to concede. The critics have to shut up. Nothing competes as good as good work that has an impact. So, yes, it's common to be underestimated, but it's also nice to have that moment of glory when you've proven them all wrong. I tell you, I love that moment when I say, OK, thank you. You underestimated me. You got that fire in my belly going. And now thank you for your compliments for the good work I've done. So take it in your stride. Nobody can make you feel inferior. Only you can make yourself feel inferior. Nobody can make you feel like you don't deserve it. Only you can make yourself feel that. So really working with your inner critics, your inner demons is so important. That's why our whole leadership model is based on the inner game and the outer game. The inner game is your sense of purpose and service, your resilience to fight back from failure, 
your learning agility. That's how we've defined our inner game at Unilever. And I really, when things get tough, I really focus on my inner game. What's my purpose? Why am I doing what I'm doing? That gives me energy. I focus on my resilience, you know, get my exercise going, prayer, meditation, gratitude journals. I get my inner resilience going and I get my learning agility going. I say, what can I learn more? Who can I learn from? How can I do this better? So focus on your inner game when you face moments of being underestimated. Very well said, Lena. I, I, I particularly enjoy that tip of how to silence your critics with um, focusing on great, doing a great job and uh, having a great impact. Um, mm -hmm. Now, another question about your career um, from one of our participants, maybe. Uh, the question is about, did you always want to be or reach this uh, a C-level executive? And is this, is this something that you've proactively mapped out in your career? How did it all fall into place and go up? It's a great question, Jose. Like I showed you my childhood photograph, you know, I was cycling like 12 miles to go to my um, high school every day, you know, to my college. And I had no idea I'd be cycling 12 miles. All I wanted to do was have an education. I did not know the world of business. I did not know what a C-suite means. I grew up in a small town where mostly people told me, why are you studying so much? Girls never get to do careers. Even my mother used to say sometimes to me, why are you so ambitious? Who will marry you if you're so ambitious? What are you going to do with all this ambition and all these studies? Because you've got to marry and, you know, be happy. And that's what we expect out of you. So you, I had no role models of women who worked in my town, who had achieved great things, who had achieved careers or worked for businesses. So I promise you, I had no idea what I was going to do. So this, but I knew that I would make a difference. I knew that I'd have a voice in the world. I wanted to do something that matters. I knew that I cared about some things passionately and I wasn't going to sit quiet. So I had big dreams, but the exact nature of those dreams, I didn't know. Even when I did engineering, I didn't know. And then when I told my dad I wanted to do MBA and I wanted to specialize in human resources, he said, who would do human resources? It was called personnel in those days. It was basically seen as a back office function. And he said, it's a back office function. It's a support function. Nobody cares for personnel. You're a telecom engineer. Go and do a master's. Become a good telecom engineer. Now that you've decided to educate yourself, go and do that. But, you know, I followed my heart. HR as a profession was never on any top tables on those days. It never was on the board of companies ever. This is 1992, 93, 94 when I was studying. But I knew that I was excited when I was learning human resources. I knew that my heart was to sing when I had to read up about it. I always say, you know when your heart sings, you know? When we send learning programs for people, people sometimes don't do it. But they do the ones that really get them excited. So if you're a budding chef, I promise you, if a recipe drops into your inbox at 12 o'clock at night, you will look at it because you're excited by it. So you learn things that you're passionate about. So I did that. but. Slowly, the passion and ambition grew as I was the first person who was the, you know, uh, on the top table being a professional HR. I was the first person in Unilever, a homegrown HR professional. Earlier, they would give the job to a technical person or to somebody from the business. So you must imagine the world as not as it is today, but as it should be. That's what gives you don't be discouraged by this hasn't been happened before. Yeah, it hasn't happened before because you're going to be the first. Something hasn't been done because it's waiting for you to make it happen. So, you know, I didn't dream when I was a young child, but I continue to be ambitious. Today, I ask myself, OK, I'm CHR of your neighbor. What do I want to do next? What do I want to have an impact in? So always set ambitions for yourself in areas you're passionate and purposeful about. Incredible. Thank you, Lena. Um, Lena, you've talked a lot about learning. We certainly feel the benefit of your appetite for learning in Unilever. And also, of course, that translates into how our employees are with lifelong learning and that real approach that we all have. Out of interest, what has been your biggest learning throughout the pandemic in the last year or so? You know, I've had some really, really big learnings. I shared about the it's the same storm, but we are in different boats. But the other thing that I also learned is the power of empathy and compassion. During this time, there's something you can't do. Sometimes you're thousands of miles away. Nobody can travel. 
but just being there with empathy and compassion and being there to listen to people has made a huge difference to people. Yeah? So I've learned the power of what we normally call the soft side of leadership. But I think the soft side of leadership is what gives us the hard edge. It allows for people to feel better. So for example, one of my one of the big things I share in the business is put your people first. Put the safety, health, and well-being of people first. And when you do that, the business will take care of itself because the people will put the business first and make sure we are continuously looking after the business. I mean, people have gone beyond the call of duty to make soap and sanitizers in this company, to make food that the world needs. They've gone beyond the call of duty. Our factories have been running all through because we make essential products. So the power of empathy and compassion, I've learned that. I've learned that it is so important to put people first. You care about the health, safety, well-being of people. You put people first, they will put the business first. You care about people, they will care about the business. So that's been another big learning through these 18 months. Thank you very much for sharing that, Lena. OK, now uh, maybe as a similarly related question. Um, as students, especially recently with uh, the pandemic, that we always hear people talking about the future of work. What can we expect or what does that mean for us in building our future careers? Yes. You know, we create something called a future fit plan inside of Unilever. Yeah, and we ask people to put down four things. First, we ask them to go through a Discover Your Purpose workshop, which almost 60,000 people in Unilever have been through, where we say we would like you to spend time to discover what really motivates you, what makes you passionate, what gets you jumping out of bed on a Monday morning. So that's the first part of Future Fit Plan. The second thing we look at, which is so important, is your well-being. So people have a chance to say, what are their energy levels? How are they feeling mentally, emotionally? physically and purposefully. So that's a part of the future fit plan because I feel if you're stressed, you're anxious, you will find it hard to learn. If you're feeling emotionally drained, you cannot learn. If you have just faced a bereavement, you cannot learn. It impacts your mental state and your emotional state. So we really ask people about their energy in the future fit plan. The third thing we ask is what are the skills you're trying to build? And the skills you're trying to build depends on the kind of jobs you want to do. So yes, the usual favorites are there. Data analytics, data numeracy, digital skills, digital marketing. So we ask people to put down the skills they want to learn. And then we ask people to talk about the leadership areas they want to grow in. So I would urge all of you to look at all of these four things, your purpose and make a plan for it, your well-being, how are you doing? Put a plan for how you're going to make sure your well-being is a good is, is, in a way, is in a place where you can learn and work and feel joyful. Think about the skills you want. What kind of jobs do you want to do? What kind of career do you want to have? Yes, you won't have a 100% clear idea because jobs are changing so fast, but you'll have some idea. And think about the leadership traits you want to build. What do you want to do more? Do you want to build a sense of resilience? Do you want to have somebody who can put a strategic vision together and create a plan for all of this together? So create your future fit plan, then you can start putting a putting an implementation plan. But do a bit of planning. You know, I when I was maybe 21, 22, I don't even remember. I had a little green diary. In those days, there were diaries. I still have it with me and it's all dog-eared and it's almost dead. And I used to keep jotting things in it, things I wanted to do, experiences I wanted to have, work, non-work, all sorts of things. I, you know, at that time I was obese and I resolved that I was going to lose weight and I was going to get fit and I've stayed fit since then. So, and when I look at the book and I show it to my kids and they laugh because I have done so many things out of things I dreamt about and planned for, skills I wanted to build, experiences I wanted to have in my life and in my work. So keep doing that. Put, make it intentional. Learning doesn't happen unless you make it intentional. Every year I start by saying, what am I going to learn new this year? I started last year by beginning to learn Spanish. I must confess, Jose, I still haven't conquered Spanish. It is difficult. Past tense, present tense, continuous tense. Verb conjugates all the time. Noun conjugates all the time. So I'm still learning Spanish. But I've added to that that this year I might possibly want to learn horse riding as well. So you've got to be intentional about learning. Create space for it in your personal and professional life. Then you will learn. 
That's amazing. Um, and I have such a vision of you horse riding, Lena, um, and learning Spanish as you go, <laughs> which is absolutely brilliant. Lena, we're moving on to our final couple of questions. Um, we've covered a lot. We've talked a lot about the amazing work that you've done. I think people um, share Jose and Ryan's just awe of all the things that you have achieved. But our finalists are really interested to know of all the great things and the changes that you've made happen, what is the one that you would say you are most proud of? <laughs> this is a difficult one, you know, because my life mantra is my best is yet to come. Like I said, it keeps me humble and grounded because I always say, yeah, that's nice. I've had a chance to do all of this, achieve all of this, but my best is yet to come. I always tell our team, our best is yet to come. It's not never feel in your life that you've achieved everything, you've got through all your lists, you've done everything possible. That can only breed complacency. That can only breed, okay, I've done it all, I've achieved it all, I have nothing more to do. As long as the list of what you want to get done is longer than the list of what you've achieved, you will stay youthful. Yeah, that's another tip from me. Always, the list of what you want to get done has to be longer than the list of what you've already got done. But you know, what I feel proud about and as a member of the senior team of Unilever, I've got a chance to play, in a, uh, play a role in it, is to create a business that truly puts sustainability at the heart of everything we do. Our purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. We have made some fabulous environmental and social goals, audacious commitments that we want to make happen. And for me, I think the joy and pride is seeing that our business is a force of good. That growing in business and winning in business goes hand in hand in creating a better world. So I really love the fact that we have on that I have played a role in creating a business that is always thinking of a better business and a better world in every decision we take in everything that we do. Very well said, Lena. And I think we are down to our last question. And I think this uh, there's a new one coming off from uh, when you shared your story about your father when you made the choice to work in HR or to follow an HR career. Um, the question asks, do you have any tips of how um, we can handle the fear of disappointing our parents for a career choice we are making? Yes, I, uh, it's a great question. And I must say that uh, parents, of my generation, particularly, which is many of your parents, because I have two boys who are 23 and 19. I do think we as parents tend to helicopter and give too many views and get involved in everything. Some of it is good, but some of it I think we could back off as well. My advice to you would be, and that take them on a journey. Take them on a journey on why you want to do what you want to do. Yeah. Don't assume they know they see the world exactly as you do. So you have to first build a shared understanding. You know, one of the big reasons I've been able to succeed is my mother and mother-in-law have played a strong role in being my support systems and looking after my children when I had busy days at work. And I always say behind every successful woman, there's a network of women. And my mother and mother-in-law have certainly played that role. And one of the things I have done with my parents, with my in-laws, is to always take them on a journey. Why I thought human resources is important, why I thought it would make a difference, give them books to read, always educate them on why you're doing what you're doing. Tell them the details of what you do at work so they begin to admire and appreciate and see the impact you're having. So take them on a journey and build a shared understanding of why, what and how. And then they will become advocates in the journey. I mean, my parents are super, super proud of me. My dad is super, super proud. He thinks HR is the most rocking thing in the world. You know? But you have to be on a journey with them. You have to be patient and build an understanding of why, what and how. Thank you very much, Lena. As always, fantastic advice. Um, and of course, thank you for making the time to join us today. It has been an absolute joy to have you. And a huge thanks to our FLO finalists and of course our LinkedIn community for joining us. Now, before we close this session, Lena, do you have any final thoughts? You know, enjoy the journey. You're all here together, FLO participants. I wish sometimes I could see you in person. I know the team has done a tremendous job of getting you immersed into everything great. Uh, you know, I call myself the best Bollywood dancer in Unilever. I mean, it's a tall claim, but nobody's challenged me. And I love dancing. And one of the things I would enjoy is to dance with all the FLL participants. 
So my uh, advice to all of you, my tip to all of you would be live and enjoy this process because it's the joy of being part of it more than winning that counts. You know, enjoy this journey, the new experiences, meeting new people, working on business problems, meeting exciting, interesting leaders, people. Just enjoy it. Immerse in it fully. Give it everything you've got and keep rocking. Thank you once again, Lena. And to our LinkedIn community, uh, it's time for us to say goodbye to you, but just for now. As you know, we still have the finals of the UFLL to crack on with, but if you want to follow the finals and see who eventually wins this year or find out more about Future Leaders League or sign up for tomorrow's keynote with our very own CEO, Alan Joe, make sure that you are following our Unilever LinkedIn page for all of the latest updates. To our Future Leaders League participants, please stay connected to this session and to our LinkedIn community. Once again, thank you very much and stay safe. Goodbye.